president of Division 49. Um, this is the division devoted to group psychology and group psychotherapy of the American Psychological Association. And I'm really excited today because I had the opportunity to review an excellent book that's being published by Rutledge Publishers. And the title of the book is Examining Social Identities and Diversity, Issues in Group Therapy, Knocking at the Boundaries. And today I have the editor, Dr. Michelle Riviero, here. And I also have two authors who author chapters in this book, um, Dr. Sheila Reddy and Dr. Carlos Taloyo. And they're going to be talking about their book. They're going to talk about their specific chapters. And I think it's really timely because this is such a critical issue that we need to address is regardless of the type of group, whether it's group therapy, an organizational group, a team, um, issues of diversity are always at the forefront. We really need to be paying attention to this and really learning as much as we can about how to help people in these groups feel like they're a part of the groups, so that we don't mirror some of the discrimination and inequality that we see outside. So with that, Michelle, I just want to show, throw it to you and to say, you know, can you tell us about the book and what gave you the idea and a little bit about it? Yeah. So um, actually, um, an editor from Rutledge contacted me in 2015 and asked if I would write a book on um, white dominance um, because I've been presenting at AGPA, which is the American Group Psychotherapy Association, their conference on looking at um, examining whiteness uh, for therapists and being able to understand how dominance shows up in the work that we do and how to um, be aware, but then to dismantle it and to find um, ways of um, more inclusive practices when doing therapy groups. Um, and so he, he asked if I would write a book on it. And um, at that time I wanted to, um, I didn't think I could write a whole book on that. And I still don't think I could because um, I think there's a, there's a wealth of knowledge in doing um, an edited book. So we hear multiple perspectives. Certainly my perspective would come from more of a Eurocentric framework. Um, because of my socialization. And so um, even though I was asked in 2015, I ended up just writing a chapter in another book that I wrote, and it was Racial and Social Justice Implications in the Practice of Group Psychotherapy. So that was, that was kind of my lead in. And then as soon as that book got published, they approached me again and said, okay, now do the first book that we asked you to do. And so then I was like, okay, now I'm ready. And so I basically thought about um, who I knew that would cover issues of diversity. And one of the, the key things that I wanted this book to be about was using the 2017 multicultural guidelines um, through an ecological approach. And I also um, wanted to use um, Kimberly, Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw's work on intersectionality. Um, because we know that how a diversity or multiculturalism has been taught is through more of a um, separate siloed instead of an integrative lens. And so I felt like um, I wanted to integrate the many different social identities. And certainly, you know, there's all kinds of identities that people um, find salience in. But I wanted to highlight some of key, key identities, key social identities that show up in our groups. And so I thought about religion, I thought about class, um, gender, race, um, ethnicity, nationality, um, uh, ability, um, those, those kind of social identities that we're always engaging with, whether we talk about them or not. So my area of interest is particularly um, working with white people to uh, understand their internalized dominance, how it shows up. Um, and it started with Peggy McIntosh's work around and um, unpacking uh, the invisible knapsack. Um, and so that came out, um, you know, like in 1988. <laughs> and um, I felt like that people are still being exposed to her work that began the conversation, um, I think in women's studies in a, in a more central way. Certainly these conversations have been happening um, in the 50s and 60s by um, scholars of color particularly. Um, and I think uh, Dr. Janet Helms' work, which is looking at uh, white racial identity, we needed a person of color to be able to help us kind of formulate our own um, identity statuses. And so um, 
a lot of my work is trying to uncover white supremacy um, ideology as therapists trained in a Eurocentric framework and how do we um, in some way dismantle it, but that, that feels um, huge and, and we're trying to figure out how to do it. And so I wanted to really um, just begin to look at groups because that's, that's my area of specialty and how to be able to do it on the multiple levels, which is both uh, institutional level uh, and the structures of institutions and how it kind of peters down into um, administrative groups, organizational groups, and then down to the therapy group. And so I wanted the book to also look at structures. And so some of it will um, look at, you know, teaching and some of it will, will look at um, religion um, and then the prison. Um, and so there's, it covers different layers of systems um, and being able to use uh, psychology sometimes isn't always great. We do a lot of theoretical work and studies and then it kind of lays in documents. And so I was trying to, um, because we're mostly practice based, the people that wrote the articles is trying to take the theory and to, to give language for how to put it into more practical application. Um, uh, so that's, that's kind of um, a long uh, introduction to, to, to the book. Um, and I'm really thankful for um, all the authors because a lot of them, um, to do this work, you have to um, expose yourself and vulnerabilities of where, um, where I go wrong um, and, and where I try to restart again and, uh, and do it better the next time. And um, so that's what I'm hoping the book kind of lays out is we're all imperfect. Um, and, but how do we learn from uh, the science and really begin to put it directly into practice? Yeah. So I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. That's really helpful because you're saying so much about the importance of intersectionality, so much about um, white privilege, and I guess helping um, white leaders know more about themselves and how they impact the groups. Um, I actually made a mistake too, because I didn't introduce you and I want to introduce each of the, the presenters today, so I didn't, so I'm sorry about that. But for those of you, um, Dr. Ribeiro is a licensed psychologist in um, Oregon. She's a certified group psychotherapist um, at or Oregon State University Counseling and Psychological Services and also a fellow of the American Group Psychotherapy Association. And I'm gonna introduce also the, the two authors who are in the uh, book as well. So I wanna hear what they wrote about. Um, Dr. Sheila Reddy is a licensed psychologist in Maryland. She has an expertise in multicultural counseling, um, substance abuse, trauma, and she is an executive coach certified by the ICF. Um, Dr. Carlos Taloyo is a licensed psychologist in Oregon. He specializes in groups, diversity, emotion-focused couple psychotherapy, and mindfulness-based treatment. He also has a master's in theology and an interest in spirituality and religion. And he also is a candidate in psychoanalysis at the Oregon Psychoanalytic Institute. So maybe both of you, um, Dr. Reddy or Dr. Taloyo, can you tell us about your chapters, like what you wrote about in the book? <laughs> Colors, why didn't Lights. you go? <laughs> Oh, you want me to go first? I just go ahead. <laughs> All right. Well, um, the chapter I wrote is about how about teaching diversity in groups, and um, I I I kind of took ser I took seriously the idea of social identities that um, that was kind of one of the um, principal constructs that that Michelle was exploring, and so I actually didn't think I could do it by myself without the idea that we are, we're always socially located. And so I invited one of my um, students, a student who took a group, group psychotherapy class with me to, um, to co-write it with me and then had this kind of a case study and our interactions with each other within the group, me as a leader, but also a person of color and him as a white man, but a participant in a group situated within a Christian institution that's situated with an APA, et cetera. So I, I kind of took seriously that ecological model that, um, that APA's multicultural guidelines put
put out a couple of years ago. And so it's about that. Um, it's, it's about understanding teaching, but situated in, situated in um, a model that was sensitive to issues of diversity at all sorts, uh, with all the different systemic levels, and then within the individual, and then within the systems that are inside the individual, everything that's internalized within the individual. So, so that was that was the idea of it was to have it be like an ex, uh, like a a case study, and then of course the second thing was the idea of teaching. How do you teach it? <clears throat> And, um, and that there's this experiential dimension to it and um, just the variety of teaching tools that you would wanna use to make sure that, um, that, that the students were engaged. So, so, so those, those two elements to me um, are what I was trying to do in, in, uh, in the paper. So, so my thought is, uh, you know, Current, the, the current context, there's a lot of people talking about all sorts of action, actions to take. And um, I'll just be honest with you, I, the, the current context paralyzes me as to what the next step is for me. But if I think of personal awareness, if I think of your own deepened understanding of the structures that you are nestled in, I think that's a big step for people to understand how they're socially located. And, and hopefully that chapter can help um, all sorts of different, different instructors and teachers um, understand the context that teaching occurs in. So that, 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 that I hope is um, the contribution of the chapter. Of course, I also think actually that Michelle could have written this because she does teach <laughs> groups. So anyway, but, that, but um, yeah, that's, that's what I was hoping in the chapter. That's pretty cool. Well, I think it turned out cool. And I was really happy to have one of my, um, one of my students write it with me. It turned it into something really vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And there's a part of it that's out of my control. And it's this unexpected interplay between his mind and mine. So it was wonderful. The, the other thing I would want to add, what, what I think is so powerful in terms of um, what happens in pedagogy is there's, there's, um, the power of the teacher. And I would say predominantly in higher education, at least in predominantly white institutions, it's the power of a white teacher because it's a different dynamic when it's a, a faculty of color. Um, and not because they, they know less, it's, it's the, the power structures and how the students in the classroom might position um, the person who's supposed to have some of the power. Right. Um, but the thing is, is that these dynamics of what happens in a classroom, especially what's happening now, like faculty are like, what, how do I have these conversations? Um, but it speaks to all the stuff that, that a, a professor is holding within them. And they can either go into, especially if they're white, fragility, like, uh, I have to somehow keep myself intact and as a result of that, I need to use power over or shutting down or whatever it might be. And you beautifully um, showcase the vulnerability of like, ah, this is, this is scary for me because this white student is challenging me. And I think right. if we can be more authentic in the classroom, we can actually get places in education versus trying to maintain the status quo. So I love your chapter for that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I loved it too. And I think oftentimes in our faculty meetings, we have this um, dilemma because it does come up in the class discussions all the time, especially if you're teaching psychotherapy or you're teaching things that are relational. And oftentimes the faculty struggle with, um, should I stick with my lecture or should I stop comment on what's the process? If someone says something that might be hurtful or something, what do, you, what do you say to faculty who are struggling? Like, do I go with process or do I stick with my lecture? Because that comes up a lot. And I think- Oh, you're good. talking to me. I thought maybe you were <laughs> talking I'm to talking me. to any so, of you. <laughs> so I'll tell you what I do. Yes. I, I engage in a process with my students. Um, I tell them there is at least three, four, five different groups that are happening. You, there's a subgroup of just the students. And then within the students, there's the second, third or fourth year students. And then the group that we're forming as a class, 
And then the other group that's like this, you know, I do a training, uh, half of the half of the class is like a training group. And so there's that, that process. So, so for me, that's the point of my chapter is, let's just begin to articulate the variety of groups that we inhabit, and the in intersectionality in that regard. So the students are in a particular position with me as the person who grades outside of the class, they're my colleagues, not colleagues, but they're my mentees. And then with, within, within the cohorts, there's, so for me, I, I just begin with that. I, I, I just continue to let that be part of the elements of the different groups that we kind of cross boundaries on and, and then see and explore whatever the tensions are. So at the very least, we, we expose where there are positions and particularly positions that involve power. Um, so, so that, that's, that's that I end, it ends up, it ends up being in the group all the time. And, and since I've, I've done these classes a lot, I know it's going to happen. So I start from the very beginning saying, you know, we're all part of different groups, different cohorts, different this. And, and, and so, you know, the, the question is, the, the question is how, when it comes up, what do you do? Well, I don't wait for it to come up. I, it's, it's happening in my life. It's, it's, I'm in it all the time. So since, since I'm the teacher, I get, I get to start the way I want to. And everyone knows that there are social identities and we're, we're going to talk about them. So. so, you know, interesting that you brought up that question and I'll kind of go with that. Um, so I actually have, was asked to do something a lot just last week by a company. And my first thought was, you know, children act as you, do not as you say. So as a leader, the most important part is, are you acting the talk? You can't talk without walking the walk. And to, to and that was actually my, my sort of, I had some bullet points. I said, I'm not gonna give you resources on how to have this conversation without understanding, you know, that there's certain steps you need to take before you even begin to have a conversation with your team as a leader. And I said, the primary part would be self-awareness and self-management. You know, so you need to, so I sent the implicit bias test as the first resource. So you need to begin to understand what your own thought process is. Maybe you don't, don't get everything, but take it in small chunks, you know, become more self-aware. And then also figure out how to manage your emotions because you can't go in front of a group and begin to have this conversation if you're gonna get triggered. So those are my two, I said, if you can't, become self-aware and have this management skill of your emotions or just walk away, you can't begin to have these conversations with people because you are going to get triggered. And then the, the last point I made was that you need to have a clear intention when you're going in. You know, we've been doing this work, we've been reading, we're comfortable in our identities. I certainly am, you know, and, and I tell people like, you know, there's just this concept that you're a therapist or you're a coach and you're coming in as an I'm blank slate. I said, I don't come in as a blank slate. I've had years of experience. I've had cultural, you know, immigration, just different experiences. All that is coming into the room with me. So mm -hmm. I can't say I am a blank slate. I'm a very full slate, <laughs> willing to open up and then have the interaction. So you're interacting with this, with this slate that has a lot. I make that very clear, like he said, you know, and that opens up that vulnerability, again, opens up conversation um, with people. In terms of the chapter, and I'm just gonna go right into sure. that. The chapter uh, I co-authored was um, Intersection of Race and Gender, Women in Leadership. When Michelle approached me, I said, well, I'm going into coaching, you know, I'm not going to group therapy, but I guess I'm working with groups. You know, we had this sort of this interesting conversation. I said, be happy to write about women in leadership because I really want to develop women of color in leadership. And um, so I said, we do that. And I don't have access to a lot of scholarly articles. I said, I could just write stuff from the top of my head and how to, but we also needed to back it up with uh, more data. And, and I, as we had this conversation, I went to a conference and I met Pratiba, who is a, who is a communications, um, she has a doctor's in communications, but she's very interested in gender stuff. So I said, well, you have access to, you know, research articles, so let's collaborate. I said, and she said, well, I need the publication because I'm a professor. I said, I don't need my name first. And she said, well, would you mind if I put my name first? I said, sure, I don't care. 
it's more the work. <laughs> so that's how that came about. So, you know, the article is authored by Pratiba and me. And the part I had the most fun with is, of course, you know, she had, this is the data and this is what it says. And then I took it up and I, and I went through all these other theories, which really was like, how do you take this stuff that women of color aren't de developed? Um, I can't remember names of authors and articles, but, you know, one of the points was if you are, the people on the boards are white American women leaders. So, you know, if you don't go up high in the ladder, you're not likely to become a board member. And if you're not, not a board member, you are le you're less likely to, you're more, if you're a board member, you're more likely to influence hiring practices, right? So if you have this layer upon layer of, you know, history where um, white women have been raised. And so that's where the intersection of race and gender comes because even within gender, there's disparities that are not right. talked about. And even within races, then, you know, you say Asian. Well, there's Asian Indian is different from Asian Korean. And I don't know where you're from, Carlos, or if you're an Asian, like, you know, it's, you, we have these, you know, I looked at Carlos and I thought Asian. See, that's, that's a bias. That's, that's, a, that's a quick thing that your brain does. And you have to be aware of it. And then question, was I right? Maybe I'm wrong. And then you, you try to get more information. And those things I'm very comfortable with to say, you know, I have things I come into the world with and I'm ready to change them. And that's what we began to talk about in the chapter. I didn't even know Michelle was writing a chapter on social identities. And that's what I ended up with <laughs> really working. Yeah. I think it's so important because what all of you are saying is that you really have to help prepare people to kind of be doing this kind of work. Like, you know, Michelle, you talked about white fragility and how this can cause reactions in us. And, you know, Shayla, you're talking about how you have to be ready to go in and know a little bit about yourself, know how to, what's going to be activated, know that something may happen. Carlos, you're saying the same thing. Like you talk about the different groups you're a part of and the structure and um, the book sounds like maybe one of the first steps too for people to get into this if they haven't and start to understand these parts of themselves. But what are your recommendations for people who don't have a lot of experience and given the social climate are starting to become more aware and are like, look, I really need to do this. What do you recommend for them? I'm gonna, I wanna just amplify the thing that Sheila said that uh, uh -huh. the implicit bias test, um, it's, it's everywhere, you know, with, uh, and it's through Harvard, but um, I've, I'm, I'm kind of planning the beginning of the next class that I teach where the beginning of it is gonna be everyone in real time will take the implicit bias test and then together we'll, we'll talk about it. It's a very exposing thing, but the thing is it exposes everyone. Every, everyone has this underlying bias that um, it's underlying, it's unconscious. And then you, by, by taking the test, I, I'm, I'm still thinking through this, but, but that, that, that feels to me like a good, a, a, a really excellent tool. And um, I did it with my family, my 13 year old, my wife, who's, who's a European American, and myself and my and my two adopted kids who are F Filipino. I'm I'm Filipino, um, and we had we had a conversation about it, and it was rich. And you know, there's this there's this racial divide between my wife and I, and then we it, it's kind of like a fixture in our relationship for the past 25 years. But um, we were able to have a conversation, a new, really fresh again with it. I know. There's this book that I listen to where there's someone who takes it every day just to continue to cue them and prime them to know that this is something to consider and think about in all of their interactions. Yeah, and the other thing, so the to-do part was, you know, and we, uh, you know, I was telling um, Pratiba, I was like, I was like, I really want to have an appendix. I really want to give them tools. She, and she's like, she's like, no, that's not part of the chapter. That's going beyond the word count. I was like, so what? I'll send it to Michelle. <laughs> this so I sent an appendix, which has really take these, you know, we did a very simple, take these two tools, one's a social identity tool, and another tool gave somebody instructions on how to do it. And then questions you can ask to prompt that information for leaders um, in terms of that first step of identity and ownership to, of what your identity can bring, all the positives and the negatives. Um, so that's added to the implicit biases. But I think it's like, you got to layer one thing over the next and that last part, I said, you have to be really intentional. 
A leader can't go in with this big an agenda. You know that, even a teacher, you go with your syllabus. So you go with very clear, where am I? What is my intention? What do I want to get out of the team? And that can set that stage to have really productive conversations and growth. We, we have a resource list at the end that we're going to post, but um, I think for white people, um, I've been doing examining white identity groups. I started with students um, about 10 years ago, and then we moved to faculty and staff. And so some work I think of um, is Robin D'Angelo's White Fragility. It's, it's um, gotten out there um, much more um, to the masses, which I think is great. Um, another, and I can't remember the author right now, but Waking Up White. And so those, those um, books that, that kind of um, hone in on personal experiences that I think white people can connect to um, is really helpful. Um, some people might push back because it, it can elicit shame, but um, the White Supremacy Workbook is, um, is another one where there's like journaling that happens. And so, so much of transformative learning, um, uh, Mesereau's work is really about having something shake your core and then having a reflective or somebody in a group setting reflect on that. So stereotypes don't um, get um, um, amplified again, but to kind of check, check your, um, your thinking and to, to have, have people hold you accountable. And so I do a lot of this work in affinity groups, so white-based affinity groups, because some of the research, um, Joe Miles, um, Daryl Wing Su, um, they looked at when white students um, got together with students of color, that what they found is that students of color get really generate, uh, they get really excited and ready to do the work and white students tend to sit back. And so what we don't need is a bunch of white people sitting back and again, having the work being done for them. And there's a lot of, I mean, I get a lot of pushback on faculty at our university saying, you're segregating, you're the problem. And it's like, actually when we get white people together, um, we're actually able to hold each other accountable much more. Uh, we're able to say um, there's a great, and it's in the first chapter of the book um, where Jonna Olson talks about detours and how white people unconsciously will detour from um, an area of talking about their whiteness. So they'll look to wanting, so one would be um, the white knight, where white people love to volunteer for people of color and give and feel really good about that. And there's, you know, there's something uh, uh, altruistic in that, but there's something also colonial in that, that I have something that, that can help you rather than this kind of um, collaborative nature or actually how we can learn from them, um, you know, whoever that, that group is that we, we want to go in and serve. But um, for us to learn actually that they, um, one of the things a colleague of mine, when he came into my university, he said, um, he, he approached a, a person of color and, and he said, what could I do for, for your people? And she said, uh, start working with your people, <laughs> meaning start working with white people instead of trying to, to figure out how to help um, us, you know, people of color. So that's, uh, so some of those resources um, of white fragility, Robin D'Angelo, um, we'll, we'll, we'll show a, a short um, list of those, but um, that's really, really imperative to do yeah. some work with white people if you're white instead yeah, of right. putting the burden on people of color. One of the things I wanted to say is that you're saying that you, there's some things you can do alone, even on your own, like you could read um, uh, White Fragility, which is a good place to start. You could also take the implicit association test, right, easily. There's a lot of different options. It's online. It's very easy to access. And you can do it for all different biases, for all different kinds of identities. Um, but you said something, Michelle, I wanted to focus on because I think it's really important. Do you feel like it's really important, in addition to doing this alone time, that it's really important to be in groups and it's really important maybe for graduate programs to maybe really require, you know, white students to talk about this, like come in the graduate program. Is there a safe space? Cause it requires a lot of space to kind of think about it and live it and have those experiences and digest it. And especially for people who may not um, have as much experience or awareness when they come to grad school, like, would you say that? Like, um, 
we need to think that it's not just in a course or a reading, but you really have to kind of process it and live it. And yeah. And, you know, one thing that you said, safe space, and Robin D'Angelo um, will talk about this, that, um, that that's what we've created for white students, a lot of safe spaces. And so it's really about creating a space that may not feel safe. Um, it's going to be a, sta a space where we have um, guidelines to, to hold each other accountable. Um, but yes, to speak to, I just wanted to say that because yeah. that's that, oh, it's like, oh, I want to be safe. Um, well, who, who gets to define safety for people of color? Um, and so I think it's really important to create a space and that it's, um, it's a brave space. I mean, people have reframed that to brave spaces that you have to show up with vulnerability mm -hmm. and courage to be able to really dig deep um, because the socialization of, of all people, but particularly white people, is so we don't see things. And it is so powerful. Um, so yes, I do agree um, that graduate programs um, need to show up in ways that, and certainly um, I took a, a racial cultural lab, um, Sheila, I think we were in the same class, um, but the, the thing was that I remember sitting there with my white, some of my white um, classmates and they would be like, this is really hard and I can, I, I'll do it here, but I don't know, I don't know if I can, you know, how this is gonna play out later. And, and I think, we need to have those conversations and to figure out um, what we're doing wrong in the teaching of psychology because we're we're just running a mill of doing some of the same things over and over again, right. um, and it's it needs it needs to be um, totally overturned and us name the um, colonialism that is in our profession. Can I, I'd like to add to that. Um, so there's like sort of a, it's interesting, right? I'm, I'm a person of color. And one of the things that happened in education when I was in school with Michelle um, was, you know, we don't really talk to teachers. You know, we're supposed to respect our elders. That's the culture I grew up with. So we don't talk face to face at this level. Um, a student came to me and said, I was talking too much in class and I was taking up class time and I was doing, I was not giving credit to the other students and I should, keep quiet. And, you know, I knew, part of me knew that participation was important in class. It took an en enormous amount of courage for me to go sit down with my professor, Dr. Pistol, I remember, and say, you know, this is what happened. The student said X, Y, Z to me. And she said, oh, that, now I, I wonder why you, you became so quiet, you know? And she was very sweet and opened and, you know, explained certain things to me and explained that, you know, I could and sort of made that culture shift that ability for me to open up. And I think that's where my interest became about empowerment, you know, the, the issues about, around color. And we were in a multicultural program. So we, other than other psychology program, our program really let us like get deeper and deeper into our self-knowledge and working through that. But the flip side is I think my chapter, our chapter focuses on that empowerment piece. Like what do you have to offer and how do you develop that? as well as how do you speak up um, and the, the, the um, things that are going on now, it's like the simple speak up, right? When you see something happening, do you feel like you have a right to go and just stop it right then and there? And that's an uncomfortable space, like Michelle said, and to empower people to get into that uncomfortable space, people who don't feel as, as empowered, I think is also important in this process. You know, I'm glad you said that, you know, it's um, how do you help people get um, tolerate the uncomfortableness? Because I think what you're saying is it takes a lot of courage and you don't want to be shaming people, but it is uncomfortable and it is mm -hmm. going to stir a lot of feelings for people that run very deep. And so what's your thought on like that? You know, what do you, how do you help people, you know, tolerate it, I guess, or. I, I have something to say. <laughs> Should I start? And then I think yeah, go ahead. both of you will chime in because mindfulness is, is moving now mm. into the social justice realm. And the, the second chapter, Gay Logan's chapter is wonderful in kind of naming compassion as a, as a really critical tool, both compassion for yourself, but also compassion for others. Yep. And so um, there's something about, again, what Sheila, you said about self-regulation 
like we need to be very mindful of what's happening in our bodies and be able to ground ourselves, um, whether we're in a teaching, whether um, we're in an organization and not in leadership, but how do you be able to speak your truth in a way that that's in relationship? Um, and that um, can move the conversation rather than use power cards. And this happened to me actually um, not too long ago in my organization when somebody said, um, we should uh, be um, trauma informed. And we were with all white people and I was just asking uh, other white people to speak up. So, um, so it's kind of like, how, how could that be a power um, card to, to say I'm being traumatic by just checking in with other white people if they have anything to say. So how we use um, things against uh, what we're trying to do, which is try to move things forward, is, um, is fascinating. And so that mindfulness, that self-attunement, so we can be attuned to others, because um, actually one of the authors, Alexis Abernathy, she has written on neuroscience and um, implicit bias. Um, and racism. And so, again, the brain is so quick to act. So mindfulness slows things down um, so we can um, regulate our nervous systems and show up in ways that's a little bit more available to ourselves and others. Um, and then again, I just want to say Gay Logan's chapter is great and just giving some really concrete examples. Carlos, Sheila, what do you think? Oh, well, to, to the, your point, I've been listening to, I do Buddhist practice and mindfulness, and Michelle knows that. I'm listening to Pema Chodron, and I actually, I've been teaching yoga on Sundays via Zoom and on Facebook Live, and at the end of it, I do a meditation, a guided. So my last week's one was about empathy and compassion, and part of that practice is really breathing in people's, you know, when you feel like you're in pain, breathing in and letting out the pain, but also understanding that there's so much more pain out there and, un, you know, breathing in that person's pain and breathing it out for mm -hmm. them. And that's the practice. And it's a practice of compassion and empathy. And, and the whole idea is every, if everybody gets into that space of understanding everyone's hurting and somebody talked to that, you know, in terms of these issues too, it's not so pol polarized. It is bringing both teams together, you know, be it the police and the general public and bringing both together and where do you find that common ground? Or not, it's not all or nothing and having compassion because I think I'm, my whole spiel in all of this is I think a big part of this is emotional regulation. The person did not regulate their emotions and therefore committed a crime. And that's really, I mean, there are other factors too, I'm not denying it, but I take it from just, just look at it in terms of human compassion and human ability to regulate what you do and what you don't do in the moment. Um, and mm -hmm. mindfulness plays a, a big part in that. Um, but to the other part is how do you ad address something that creates so much difficulty? I mean, when I talked about disempowerment, I tell people, I said, as an Indian woman, I'm a woman of color, but I also have a certain privilege because as a community, we do have a positive look upon, you know, you, people look, one of the stereotypes is you're a doctor or an engineer. It's a good stereotype to have, right? And so I acknowledge that privilege. And I have people in my community generalize and say negative things about different cultures. It's a very uncomfortable thing in a party to go and say, well, you know, that's not really true. <laughs> Nobody, but I do it. I think you're saying that it takes a lot of courage to confront people and to be and stand up to it and to be anti-racist and to... Um, and tolerate what happens after, you know, like it's it, like kind of what Michelle said, it's not easy. This isn't an easy or comfortable. Kind of yeah, and you, you learn, you teach yourself to get over the uncomfortableness. Oh, my point was because you have an intention to cure. Yes. If we look at as a psychologist, we look at as a healthcare, our intention is to help and cure. And I think I am very mindful when I get into something that I'm willing to tolerate discomfort because my intention is to help. Great, right, great. Right. I know we're running out of time. Do you have any last thoughts you want to share with us? Um, you've given us a lot, and I really, I, I hope people who watch this um, purchase the book. It's really rich with so much information, such a good start for people, um, and also people who are doing work with different kinds of organizations. There's things for athletes, there's things for counseling centers, yeah. um, all kinds of settings. It was really, really rich, but do you have any last things you want to add? Mm -hmm. 
I think, I think for me, it would just be, um, don't just read the book, but see it as a call for action and to really figure out um, how whatever role or position you play in your organization, that you use it to better, um, better the organization, but ultimately it betters our clients and our, our world. And, and we're, not, we're not just a nation uh, that's, that's struggling. We're a world that's struggling because colonialism acro- is across the world. And so how do we learn from each other and not keep repeating the same um, problems um, and violence over and over again? So um, we do have some resources that we'll post in just a minute, but that would be my thing is not just to read it, but to really dig deep and, and see it as a call to action and do something. I second that. So we want to, do we want to do share the resources now? Just thank you so much, Sherry, for, um, yeah, for having us talk about it today. Yeah, thank yeah. you for all of you guys. Thank you so much.